Hi, church. It's good to be with you again. It's, I tell you what, it's, um, your heart does grow fonder the longer you go without seeing people. But I'm always praying for you. I'm always uh, just online, just encouraged by you. And it's, I love hearing the stories of how you're in the Word. You're in the Word. You're every day. That's, we've trained you well. You're in the Word every day. You're doing your soaps. You're uh, posting some very positive stuff. We need that in our day. Uh, everything you read is so negative, and so uh, it's the church supposed to be the light of the world, and so a good job being a light. So we uh, we come today, and we're going to have church again online. You get to be at, at home and join in. Uh, I encourage you to get your Bibles out, get your notes. When we worship, get up. Uh, you know, you're in the comfort of your own home, so uh, just go for it. All right? Well, let me uh, hand it over to Pam and tell you what's going on. All right. Welcome, East River. Good to see you. If you are new for the first time, we want to welcome you too. And uh, we have a a text if you're new to East River Fellowship. So text new to ERF to 94000 and follow the prompts. We would love to get to know you and to be able to communicate with you. So if you would take just a moment to do that really quick. And then next... We, have, we are doing church at home, right? So it's been kind of fun. It's been really interesting. And I know that uh, churches all over the country, all over the world are doing exactly the same thing. And you know what? It's pretty cool because people who wouldn't normally come into a building are seeing the Word of God, are hearing the Word of God online. And so that's exciting. But would you like the East River TV channel. Would you like it? Would you subscribe to it? And then share it with somebody that you want to reach out to. And then finally, we are being asked, how do I give my tithes and my offerings or my missions check or anything like that? And we have three ways to give. First of all, it's online at deeperlives.com. Go to the giving tab Click that and follow the prompts. The second way is through the East River app. And you can find that in your app store under East River Fellowship Church. And there's a giving section there. And then lastly, you can mail in a check. And lots of you have been doing that. Thank you for being faithful to God's work. And you can find the address on our website at the bottom of the homepage. And, you know, when we stay faithful to give back to God what he has given us and so bless us with uh, that puts us under his umbrella of protection. So good job, church. Well done. Are you ready to worship? We are. So Pastor Steve's ready for you. Go ahead, Steve. Keeper of the day and night Holder of the sun in the sky Cause you command the waters and the wind There's not one thing you're not greater than Greater than the mountain that's in front of me You are greater so much greater greater than the power of the enemy you are greater so much greater you're faithful over all of my days God above the storms that I face My hope is in your name and nothing less Cause there's not one thing you're not greater than Greater than the mountain that's in front of me You are greater so much greater greater than the power of the enemy you are greater so much greater and 
and no guilt, no shame, no sin, no stain is greater than the great I am, and no fear, no grave, and no other name is greater than the great I am. And no guilt, no shame, and no sin, no stain is greater than the great I am. And no fear, no grief, and no other name is greater than the great I am. No guilt, no shame, and no sin, no stain. Great I am. Because greater than the mountain that's in front of me, you are greater, so much greater, greater than the power. Oh, the enemy, you are greater, so much greater. So much greater, Lord. When I think of all this, I fall to my knees and I pray to the Father the creator of everything in heaven and on earth. And I pray that from his glorious, unlimited resources, he will empower you with the inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. And your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. May you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how far, how wide, how long, how high, how deep his love is may you experience the love of Christ though it is too great to understand fully you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God greater than the mountain that's in front of me you are greater so much greater, greater than the power of the enemy. You are greater, so much greater. Well, I searched the world, but it couldn't fill me. Oh, man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough. Then you came along and put me back together. Now every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. Not afraid. I want to show you my weakness, my failures and flaws. Lord, you see them all, and you still call me friend. Because the God of the mountain is the God of the valley. Oh, and there's not a place. You 
mercy and grace won't find me again. Oh, oh, oh there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. You turn morning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who cares. You turn graze into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. You're the only one who can. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. I searched it all, Lord. And there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing, nothing is better than you. Water to my soul. 
your word is a lamp up to my feet. Jesus, I love you. I love you. Jesus, you're the risen and exalted one, Jesus, Jesus, you're risen, Lord, Jesus. You are the risen and exalted one, Jesus. Your name is like honey on my lips. Your spirit like water to my soul. Your word is a lamp of to my feet, Jesus, I love you, I love you, cause your name is like honey on my lips, your spirit like water to my soul, your word is a lamp to my feet. Jesus, I love you, I love you. Jesus, I love you, I love you. In my mother's womb, you formed me with your hands, known and loved by you. Yeah. Before I took a breath, when I doubted, Lord, remind me, I'm wonderfully made. You're an artist and a potter, I'm the canvas and the clay. You make all things work together for my future and for my good. You make all things work together for your glory and for your name. There's a healing light Just beyond the clouds Though I walk through fire I see clearly now And I know nothing has been wasted No failure or mistake You're an artist and a potter I'm the canvas and the clay But you make all things work together for my future and for my good you make all things work together for your glory and for your name and when I doubt it Lord remind me I'm wonderfully made you're an artist and a potter I'm the canvas and the clay And I know nothing has been wasted No failure or mistake You're an artist and a potter I'm the canvas and the clay And you make all things work together For my future and for my good, you make all things work together for your glory and for your name. And when I doubt it, Lord, remind me 
and I'm wonderfully made. You're an artist and a potter. I'm the canvas and the clay, and I know nothing has been wasted, no failure or mistake. You're an artist and a potter. I'm the canvas and the clay, and you're not finished with me. You're not finished with me yet. You're not finished with me. You're not finished with me yet. You're not finished with me. You're not finished with me yet. You're not finished with me. You're not finished with me yet. When I doubt it, Lord, remind me I'm wonderfully made. You're an artist and a potter. I'm the canvas and the clay. And I know nothing has been wasted. No failure or mistake. You're an artist and a potter. I'm the canvas and the clay. You make all things work together for my future. And for my good, you make all things work together for your glory and for your name. Amen. Amen. In Psalm 51, verse 10, this is what King David says. He says, create in me a clean heart, O God and renew a steadfast spirit within me. See, in this context, King David messed up really bad. And I mean, and if you, if you read back this story with, with King David and, and Uriah and Bathsheba, he committed uh, adultery, he committed murder, and, and this is a man after God's own heart. And he comes to this place where he repents. He says, God, I need you to create in me a brand new heart. You need to put a new spirit within me. And I love how King David goes to the creator and asked, and asked him to say, create something, uh, create something in me brand new. He goes to the one who made us. He goes to the one who gave us our spirit and says, I need something brand new. As I was reading this and before I came up here, I remember God has reminded me of a story when I was 16. And, and you know, I ended up uh, getting heavily uh, into drug use more at this time in my life. Well, in my mid-20s, when I was clean and sober for years, God spoke to me. And, and what he said in short, he's like, you should have never have done that. He said, you should have never have done that when you were 16. And I was just floored. I didn't know what to do. But this is how good God is. He says, but do you know what? I will undo what you did. I will actually undo that. And he had to create me a brand new identity. He had to give me a new heart, a new spirit. We see that in Ezekiel 36 as well. But this is what I want to ask right now. What do you need God to create brand new in you? My, heart, my heart's breaking right now because I know there's people that maybe there's words that people spoke against you. And you're starting to believe this lie and this false identity of who you are. Do you need God to create in you a brand new identity? You know, maybe something was taken from you that shouldn't have been. Do you need God to do a new creation in you and restore that? The word says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, that if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Behold, all old things have passed away and all things have become new. We serve a creator who's big enough to do a recreation in your life. And do you know what? There's some of us who need that, whether that's confidence, um, whether that's just self-image, whether that's self-worth. Let the creator tell you who you are. Let him do this mighty work in you. King David recognized that. I recognize that, and I pray that you do as well. We serve a good God, amen. So just right where you're at, just thank him. Get your hearts ready to be able to receive uh, the next part of the service and what we have for you. Uh, with that, I want to invite Pastor Carlos up, and he's going to introduce our next speaker. Thank you, Daniel. That was a good word. That was a good word. You know, you uh, are uh, in for a, a treat, another, another treat today. Uh, several weeks ago, I had someone come and, and, and uh, do a teaching that was so amazing. I mean, we were listening and had uh, goosebumps. And we're like, wait a minute, there's, there's, there's got to be more. And sure enough, there was more. And so uh, we've asked him to come back and, and really expound on, on what he had taught uh, before and, and add to it. And that is uh, Chet Gerhardt, who is our youngest elder, uh, is uh, coming. And, and so he's going to go ahead and bring the word today. So come on up, Chad, if you would. 
Well, hello, church. It is, it's always uh, such a privilege to stand here. Let's just pray and lift this time up. Lord, I thank you so much. You're the God who can do wonders. You're the God who can do miracles. You're the God who sees into all of our hearts. We stand before you completely open, knowing that you have your way here. So I thank you, Father. Set this time apart and let us run for you with all passion, with all fervor, because we know who's backing us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so I... Uh, I first, I want to thank Pastor for making my dream come true. I am now a time traveler, okay? So I get to speak now, and I know that this is going to be broadcast at some point in the future. Um, and I didn't even need a TARDIS. I didn't need to slingshot around the sun. I didn't need to build a DeLorean. I'm a time traveler, okay? But in the spirit here, even though we're social distance through time and space, we're sharing this moment together in the spirit. And so it's very, uh, it's very special. Um, Last, uh, as I shared last time, um, the Lord put a burden on my heart to try to understand what is this faith thing? What is this faith thing? And so I've been trained as a scientist, and you've heard of this, this phrase, you may have heard it, seeing is believing. Seeing is believing. Now, I have a couple of problems with that, um, that it's, it's just not true on several levels. That seeing is, um, first of all, in order to see, you need to have eyes. And frequently, in many of the experiments that we do um, as physicists, somebody had to build the equipment, they had to build the microscopes, they had to build the electronic equipment that we go and we use to probe, whether it's semiconductors or whether it's some, um, an object falling or whether it's the trajectory of a spaceship. We use these instruments in which to uh, gauge the, um, to, to, to see with. But something had to motivate a scientist to go and build those in the first place. Something, someone had to motivate someone to go and search for these priorities in the first place. And so the very fact that we're looking is, um, is basically had to be driven by faith. And a lot of um, kind of the excitement that, was, that I felt in the academic community is we know that something's out there. And we search for it, we search for it, we push and we push and we push until it comes to pass. And which it looks a lot like faith. Um, the second problem that I have with that is that the transaction always doesn't happen. Sometimes when we see a miracle with our eyes, if we were to see a miracle with our eyes, would that necessarily generate faith in the heart? And that's not always the case. It's often, a, um, for example, you saw in, in Exodus how Pharaoh um, saw miracle after miracle after miracle, yet his heart was hardened, was unwilling to change until something special was taken from him. I've heard of people who have been physically healed but then go into a lifestyle because they're unwilling, still unwilling to recognize of what uh, God had done for them. We see miracles when we walk out every single day. We see what God has built for us, what he's made for us. And we see what's written down for us in advance. And the question that we have now is, is our heart going to be hard or is it going to be soft? So what I talked about last time is we looked at the directionality of faith, that faith really runs opposite to the arrow of passivity. And so what I, what I want to look at here is um, I want to bring, go back to this uh, really cool passage in James. So I really like this. If you like it, it's like, one thing that I like about this is it's a case study. So there are other places where um, you have to dive into it and you want to get the cultural and the background and you want to see how they're talking about it in the original language. And here, in this particular passage, he's speaking very directly. And it's, it's um, very self-contained. It's right there. And this is what he says. He says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. This is a very powerful, powerful promise. And it's very straightforward. It's very simple. It says, if you don't know what to do, ask God. And this is who he is. He gives to all liberally. No one's disqualified. He gives to all without reproach. He doesn't hold a grudge. This is something that he wants to do. And it will be given to him. It not might, it will be given to him. So here we have on record a promise from God that he says, if you ask me, I will give it to you. It's kind of like... and. Sometimes I think we've come in prayer, I've certainly done this before, where I come to God and I say, um, you know, I come to him with my complaints rather than my requests. And the kingdom of God is not really driven by need, it's driven by who asks. Jesus said, ask and you will receive. Ask and you will receive. He didn't say, okay, well, if you need it, then I'll just proactively give it. He says, I want you to ask. And I actually have this happen many times in our own household. My, my five-year-old, he will come up to me and he will he'll try to drop some sort of hint. He says, Dad, I would really like some ice cream right now. And so he knows this, so I turn to him and I say, well, that's very interesting. Thanks for letting me know. 
And, you know, thanks for that factoid. And mom will prompt and says, hey, you can ask dad. You can ask dad for it. And he'll say, okay, dad, may I please have some ice cream? And I'll say, yes. Now I'm very willing to, to jump in. And sometimes we need to come to God. We need to ask him. We have, this, um, we have this amazing access to him. And he says, if you don't know what to do, ask God, and he will give you wisdom. A very powerful promise. And then the very next verse is rather astounding to me. He puts in the word but here. But let him ask in faith. Now what, what's happening here? Here we have a solid promise from God, and now the very next verse is it's like, oh man, you spoiled it. This was supposed to be a you know, Loctite, solid, something I could stand on, I could take to the bank, and now you're going to put a but at the end of it? But wait, it's not a caveat. It is not a cop-out. He's actually telling us something very, very important here. He says, but let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. And we looked at this word doubting, which really comes from the Greek. It says diakrino. It means to judge between. This prefix dia, this is where we get the word diameter or dissect or discern. It means to judge between two possibilities. And really what it means is I'm looking external and I'm saying, I'm trying to look for my cues. So even though I'm saying, God, I trust you, I'm asking you for this, I'm still looking at everything that all my inner workings is geared to figure out what externally should I do before I take action. And if we're in that state of doubt, where we're taking our cues from external phenomena, it says we're like a wave which is driven and tossed by the wind. We are passive. Whereas where God wants us to stand on something, he says, I've downloaded something into you. I've told you who you are. No, this has to go from the internal outward. Now, there was one part, so that's kind of a mini review of what we talked about last week. And we talked about the difference between, for example, a windmill versus an electric fan or a solar panel versus a light bulb. And there's the verse right after this. There's something in that just gripped me when I read this passage. I've read it time and time and time again. So it says, don't doubt. You need to ask in faith, but don't doubt. And then it says right after it says, but let that not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. Let that man not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. And something about that just gripped me. I'd seen it many times. And when I used to read this, I used to think that this was a fancy way of saying, okay, if you doubt, you're disqualified and you're not going to get anything from the Lord. That's actually not what it's saying. This here is a command in the Greek. It says, let not that man suppose. Greek has this feature of where actually you can give commands in the third person. So if I talk to somebody and say, go to the store and get some milk, that's a direct command. We have that in English. But if we want to make a command in the third person, we have to add this this, uh, word here, let not or just like in, the, in Genesis, let there be light. In both Greek and Hebrew, there is a way to give a third-person command. And this is what it's saying. He's saying, let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. And when I read this, something just gripped me right here. It says, Lord, I am so sorry, because I have many times, I have come and I have supposed. I have supposed. Holy Spirit wouldn't have put this here. He would not have put this here if he didn't know our tendencies. That we come to God and we say, God, I'm asking you for wisdom, and I'm ignoring what you're telling me to do. And then I say, well, I'm going to hedge my bets, and then I'm going to pretend like I'm going to get something from you. This is like, it's like, a, it's like a bluff. We're trying to bluff against God, even though it seems it's ridiculous. He's the one who knows everything. I pulled two examples from Scripture here. Um, The first is in Deuteronomy, uh, it's recounted in Deuteronomy 1, and I just want to read it to you. Um, This was, I think many of us are familiar with the story of the 12 spies that were sent out. God had promised the children of Israel in advance, says, I'm giving you a land, and it is so good. It's flowing with milk and honey. And he says, you know what, he even told them in advance, it's going to be inhabited, but I'm going to drive those people out before you. He laid out everything in advance. He showed them miracle after miracle after miracle. And when they got there, they balked. Ten spies went in, 12 spies went in, and 10 came back with a bad report. They basically told ghost stories to the rest, and everyone was wailing and crying. And there were two men that stood up, Joshua and Caleb, says, no, we can do it, we can take them. But because of their unbelief, they were unable to enter. 
Now we know this story, but what happened after that, immediately after that, this is, this is what Moses is talking about. Moses, is, this is his, his account of it. He says, Then you answered and said to me, We have sinned against the Lord. We will go up and fight, just as the Lord our God had commanded us. Something happened. After this, they couldn't believe, We missed it. We missed it. And now they suddenly are showing up for battle and says, Okay, we're ready. Yet nothing had changed. And this is what Moses says. And the Lord said to me, Tell them, Do not go up nor fight, for I am not among you, lest you be destroyed before your enemies. So I spoke to you, yet you would not listen, but rebelled against the command of the Lord, and presumptuously went up into the mountain. And the Amorites who dwelt in that mountain came out against you and chased you as bees do, and drove you back from Seir to Hormah. Then you returned and wept before the Lord, but the Lord would not listen to your voice nor give ear to you. So you remained in Kadesh many days according to the days that you spent there. I've had this happen in my life. I've had this happen where I've kind of ignored God. I will push him to the side and says, I'm going to act spiritual. I'm going to show off because of pride or because of something that's some prejudice that I have. And God is saying, don't suppose. Don't pretend there's something we haven't dealt with. One area where I used to do this would be in fasting, where I didn't really understand it, but I do it because everybody else around me would do it. And I said, Lord, I'm fasting. See how I'm doing this? I'm doing this for you. It's really painful, and I'm going to grin and bear it, and then you're going to reward my prayers, right? Nope. That's not the way it works. He's calling on us to have a genuine heart. You also see this, for example, when certain groups will say, the world will end in such and such a day. And you know, they say, if, maybe if I just act like I have enough faith, then maybe God will see that and reward me as if I had the correct faith. And he's saying, no, that's not the way it works. The other example here is from Acts 19. It's a rather humorous example, um, certainly not for those who were involved. But you had these Jewish itinerant exorcists. They would go around and they would cast demons out of people. Um, an important job, no doubt, but they would come and they heard about how Paul was having this amazing result. The authority of the believer is really amazing. You hear reports, even today, from around the world of how believers can say, I cast you out in the name of Jesus, and spirits will leave people, and people will be delivered from bondages and from oppressions that they've been held under. And when these Jewish exorcists saw this, that Paul had this power, they said, we're going to try this too. And so they come up to this one guy who is uh, demon-possessed, and they said, we exorcise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. And this this guy have been filled with the demons stands up and says, I know Paul and I know Jesus, but who are you? And proceeds to beat them, strip off their clothes, and send them out of the house naked and bleeding. That's not where we want to end up, church. We don't want to be people who suppose. We don't want to be a people who are double-minded. What is a double-minded people? A double-minded person is someone where if you change their environment, if you change what's external, their behavior changes. If I say that God is my defender at work, I can see my prayer time and here at church be very pious and say, God is my defender. I can sing worship songs and say, God is my defender, God is my defender. But then when I step into a new environment, the external has changed. Does my behavior change? Do I trust him? Do I trust him to be my defender and speak the truth consistently, constantly? Do I stand up for somebody? Am I willing to take the hit for somebody for doing the right thing, knowing that he will defend me? It would be like if I walk out and I take my, my wallet and I go out and I act like I have $5 million in my account. That's going to catch up with me very quickly. And so here's, the, here's, here's my exhortation, church. Don't suppose. Grow. There is a way in which that we can grow our faith and we do not have to suppose. We don't have to pretend. We have a loving Father who can protect us and who can take care of us. There's, I need to take one quick detour to Hebrews 11 because I felt this was on my heart. I wanted to convey this to you. Um, you knew this verse was coming. When people talk about faith, almost every single time you have to bring out Hebrews 11.1. 1. But I admit until the last two weeks, I actually did not really understand this verse. I had studied it many times. I tried to look into it, tried to understand it. And usually it gets brought out with this when somebody says, well, what's the definition of faith? What is, what is faith? And some, almost on cue, someone will pull out Hebrews 11.1. 1. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. 
And but I, what do I do with that? That doesn't sound like a definition to me. I can say like a definition, I can say grilled cheese sandwiches are delicious, but delicious doesn't define grilled cheese sandwiches. When I eat it and I understand it, then I understand, okay? Then I understand what that definition of, it's more real to me. But something in this caught my eye, and I just want to pull out this simple thread, that unstoppable faith determines the last man standing. Okay, this is my, I'm just trying to get you to remember this. Unstoppable faith determines the last man standing. Here's what I mean by this. Let's take, um, at Intel, I work for two, I have the pleasure of working with two managers above me who are absolutely ferocious. They are absolutely, they are brilliant in what they do. And when they walk, they command a tremendous amount of respect. And I have learned that because when they say something, they're not just saying using idle words. So if I want to know which direction the company is going to head on some technical matter, I listen to what they are saying. Because I know that if anybody comes to challenge them, they are going to lose, all right? To put it very bluntly. And I have been put in situations where everybody else is saying one thing, and it's these two gentlemen who are saying, you know, says, no, I want you to go fight. I want you to go and says, no, this is not the right decision. And sure enough, I know I can watch because I know that they have the faith on these technical issues to continue to change around this entire company. And sure enough, you watch this propagation where it's eventually step by step by step. Even though there's arguments, even though there's debates, eventually this wins the day. When we talk about faith as being the evidence of things not seen, we are talking, if you want to know what is happening in the unseen realm, look for the people who have faith. Look for where people are acting. Look for where God is moving. Because he's not about... He's, he's not always going to do, be showy in the same way that the world is. But faith is the evidence of things unseen. I made the point last time that faith is neither requires, demands evidence, nor ignores it. But faith is the evidence. Here at our discipleship program, I can see it in people when they walk into the door just by making that simple decision of faith, saying, I am going to take this course, and no matter what's going to happen, I'm going to finish it. I start to see something grow inside them where God says, that is enough. That's enough of a seed where I can take that and I can grow it. I can nurture it. And you just watch. And eventually as dominoes, their life gets changed. Their spouse's life gets changed. Their children's lives gets changed. And it starts to overflow. This happened in my life and we've seen it again and again where God will take that simple seed of faith. Sometimes we ignore, we think of, you know, as Jesus said, if you have faith like a mustard seed, you can move mountains. And sometimes we focus on the size of the seed, which we should, but there's also has that seed-like quality where it is unstoppable. Pastor preached a series on the unstoppable spirit-filled church. And when we lay hold of what God has for us, when we lay hold of his word in faith, we are absolutely unstoppable because he is backing us. And at the end of the day, it's going to be let God be proved true, let God be true, and every other man a liar. There is this interesting, it's, there's this, so I kind of skip the middle part here. It says faith is the substance of things hoped for. This is a very interesting word. It's a very deep word, difficult to translate into English. But it's, the Greek says hypostasis. It means understructure. It's basically the support beams of a building. I had a pastor once that said, kind of, faith is the currency of the kingdom. And the kind of the concept here is that the things that we hope for, the children we are praying for, that breakthrough in our marriage we want, those things that we are hoping for, that hope that where we have pinned and says, God, I know you are true. I know that you are on my side. All of that is going to be built on this substructure of faith. And you watch. You watch how this is built step by step by step. And if you ask God to give you wisdom, he will open your eyes to see it. And not only does he open your eyes to see it so that you can understand, but he opens it because you see a beauty of a God at work who can change lives. So sometimes people say, follow the trail of money. Um, I say, follow the trail of faith. All right, now I want to come back to James because there's something kind of cool here I want to show you. Um, I, I, could, I, could, it was, I was rather shocked when I saw this. So now I'm going back to the beginning of this passage. James opens up this letter and he says, basically, I'm sending this to you guys. You, I know you're scattered around. I know you're disconnected from your family and your friends not unlike the situation we are right now with social distancing. And he jumps right in with very little preamble. He just says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. 
But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. This, this is another word which is difficult to find an exact correlation in English, but it's patience, endurance. And when you look it up in the Greek, the actual literal translation of it is hupomone, which means to stay at home. Something we have a lot of experience with at the moment. Or you might say shelter in place. And here is the concept that I've been placed under authority and that I have been called by Jesus to abide. He says, you know, he who abides in me, you will bear much fruit. And what is it going to take for me to leave my home? Think through your activities this week. What did it take to make you leave your home? And I hold on to this verse as real precious because as I've been walking with the Lord and as I've been seeing trials come up, as I've had people attack me or come at me or deeply offend me, I pull out this verse and I remind myself before God and I remind myself that there is a breakthrough on the other end of this challenge. And it's to the point now where I get excited for what he's about to do. I know that through these trials which they come, that there are upgrades in store for me, that I get an upgrade in my dependence upon him. And it says, let patience have its perfect work, that you may pray perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Church, we have to abide under his roof. The best example of this comes from Matthew 8. There was a centurion who had a servant who is ill, a beloved servant. And this centurion had worked so hard at his job. In fact, he had learned so much from his job that his faith even caused Jesus to marvel. We can learn from the work where God has put us. But his servant was ill and he needed, he, he heard about Jesus. And so he sent, he sent first some of the elders of the Jews, then he sent some friends over and they pleaded with him, this man's worthy for you to have him, have you come. And the centurion heard that Jesus was coming and he sent this response. He says, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak a word and my servant shall be healed. And Jesus says, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Here's my point. We need to meet God on his terms, not on ours. We don't get to suppose or make up some fanciful bluff or try to follow a ritual to twist God's arm. We have someone who is, who is very willing to work with us. He's very willing to train us. And our response to him needs to be, says, God, you are right. You get to set the parameters. With the season of trial that we're in, um, there's, a, there's a poem that goes like this. With every flash of weakness, with every hunger pain, I thank the God who made me and sets my heart aflame. How many years I fought him, raging in my chains. He came to me so gently, I fought his rules again. O oh, stubborn heart, believe, give him all your grief. It's consequence of sin withholding your relief. He is right to stand in judgment. Right to, he is right to stand in judgment of all that I've profaned. Right to set his terms and right to call me vain. Yet he loves me with a passion, relentless in pursuit. Unfazed by my unwilling years, he whispers life and truth. He paid my debt, then blessed me. Who does this kind of thing? I call him then my captain, my lover, and my king. Lord, we're yours. And we say you have every right every right to set your terms. We believe you because you not only explain the why, you're also there, so a voice of someone we trust, and you're also one who has proven himself faithful again and again. Father, let, hearts, let faith grow in our hearts this season and let us operate with a strength that only you can provide. I thank you so much for your gifts towards us and for your love towards us. In Jesus' name, amen.
The Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. The Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. 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 The Lord bless you and keep you. May His face shine upon you. And be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. 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 favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and their children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and the children and the children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and the children and the children and the children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and the children and the children and the children may his presence go before you and behind you and beside you all around you and within you he is with you he is with you in the morning in the evening in your coming and your going in your weeping and rejoicing he is for you he is for you he is for you he is for you. 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 The Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Let's finish with Amen, which means so be it. Amen. 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 Oh, Father, Amen. 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 From your heart singing. Amen. Amen. Amen.
May his favor rest upon you. May the favor of the Lord rest upon you and your family and your children and your children's children. Lord, what we do today, let it reverberate throughout history. God, let there be changes in families right now that affect generations. Lord, in this time when we're separated from a lot of things that we're used to, God, let us not be separated from you. Let us draw closer and closer and closer to you, Father. We see the change happening in the world. We see people ready for you, God. We see those that have run, they run themselves right into a corner. And now they're turning back and they're looking for you, God. Lord, reveal yourself to the hardest of hearts today. That they would look up and see you, feel you, hear you. And most importantly, God, that they would respond to you and your righteousness your mercy and your grace and your glory, God. But most importantly, God, let them respond to your love. We ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Church, we love you so much. We can't wait to be with you. But until that time, here we are on East River TV. Share this with family and friends. We love you. Take care. Take it away.